All right, guys, thanks for tuning in today. Today, our video lecture is going to cover conditional expectations. Um, this is going to be our first video that contains more than one random variable. So um, this video is probably going to be a little less theoretical um, and a little more time spent on the problem itself, um, just due to the time limitations that we're going to be dealing with. So today, we're going to be covering conditional expectations and we're going to define those, show some properties, and then we're going to do a problem that was on a previous actuarial exam. So, conditional expectations require more than one random variable to be considered. So, we're going to call those x, as we normally do, and then we're going to have y. So, these are going to be our two random variables. So, a conditional expectation is usually written like this. much like a conditional probability. Um, if you take a look, you'll notice the exact same um, style of um, writing it and notation, things like that. Um, it's not too bad um, as far as the actual mathematics behind it. It just requires some practice, and it does tend to appear on actuarial exams, so it's always good to know this kind of stuff. So this is how we define a conditional um, expectation for a discrete distribution or for discrete random variables. And it may be hard to tell in the video. I don't think it is just from the way I'm writing. Um, there is a differentiation, especially in your classes. Obviously, whatever it does for you to get the correct answer in actuarial exams, they're not going to grade your actual work. They're going to be more concerned about the answers. But you have to make sure that when you're writing these, that these are random variables. So those will be capitalized right in here. This is also a random variable, as is this. So professors tend to want to make sure that you know that these are random variables and that these can take on any value. So um, we'll notice that this is a derivation of this and we'll show exactly what this term is right here. Once again, these are random variables and these are not. These are values in some sense. Now recall that all of this is for a discrete distribution. We're now going to go to our continuous case. So I'm going to get rid of all of this. This is just our formal theoretical definitions. Um, we will obviously use those definitions in our upcoming problem, but um, it's always good to know that kind of stuff. We now have our continuous case. We have the exact same style of notation, of course. The only significant difference is our integration as opposed to summations. Recall that our infinity um, limits here are simply just a way to make it very clear that that's the domain of whatever function that we're talking about, much like we had in um, regular expectations, not conditional. We always had that negative infinity to infinity kind of as a placeholder. So you'll notice it's dx here, not y. And once again, we'll define this term for conditional um, probabilities that are um, continuous. We can define these in the following way. So looks very similar to exactly what we had with our discrete distributions. Um, the key thing to me uh, memorize here is that 
this right here is taking on a value. So we could have um, this little y here. This could be 6, 5, it could be anything. Um, it's not a random variable, this right here. Also, as a result, we always integrate with respect to our random variable, which in this case is x. That's why we have this dx right here. Um, students tend to <clears throat> get confused about these kind of things and make small mistakes that tend to carry throughout a problem and unfortunately you're not going to get any partial credit on the actuarial exam. Similarly right here, an easy thing to remember is that when you're looking for this conditional um, distribution, all you have to do is look at this. The second term ends up in the denominator here. So this is our joint um, probability density function, and then this is a marginal probability density function. And we obtain this from integrating our joint distribution. So all we would have to do to find that if we wanted to is to integrate this with respect to x. Because we want to integrate and then get rid of our x and end up with a marginal function that only contains y. So that should make a little bit of sense. If not, you can actually <clears throat> solve a problem like this and you'll find out that you're going to end up with a function that only contains y's. But that should be pretty clear by now with previous experience with calculus. We've also got um, one really significant property for conditional expectations that we'll show, and that's called our double expectation property. Not sure if it's ever been used on an actuarial exam, but it does appear in the text that I'm using, and it's just an interesting little snippet that we can turn to quickly before we go into our problem. So this is what our double expectation property states, and these are random variables if you have a hard time telling. This will be true. Um, we don't have time to go through a proof, but I do believe that there's a proof of it in the textbook that I'm using a probability course for actuaries. The problem that we're going to be doing today is problem 37.13. And I'll read that to you guys, just in case you can't find the text. It says, the stock prices of two companies at the end of any given year are modeled with random variables x and y that follow a, dis a distribution with joint density function this. So you may notice that some of the notation is a little different. We could put x and y as random variables down here. Um, it's not strictly necessary. Some texts do it, some don't. Some professors prefer to do it, others don't. Um, so I'm sure you'll run into different styles of notation. Don't let that um, trip you up too much. Just kind of develop your own system for understanding and remembering how to manipulate these kind of situations and you won't run into any trouble. What is the conditional variance of y given that x equals x? So we want the conditional variance of y. So let's find our marginal density function of x. And I'll get rid of this because that's a little hard to explain um, just through audio. So we want the marginal density function of x, which we're going to denote as this. So all we have to do is integrate this function with respect to y. Now we notice our limits of integration here for y, so we integrate across x and x plus 1. We're going to get 2xy remember we're substituting for y here, so y equals x to x plus 1 
we're going to get 2x, x plus 1, minus 2x squared. And when we evaluate this, we get 2x. So our marginal density function of x is the exact same as our joint density function. And we should note that in this case we also have um, a domain to specify, which is the same as up here. And since we don't have y, we, dis we discredit this. We don't bother with that. And we also note that this must be true. So, if this is true, we're going to move this real quick. I guess we can't do that. We're going to have to erase some of this. We'll just remember that our marginal for x is the same as our joint. Okay, so that was the result of what we just did. If that's true, we can now obtain the following. according to some of our properties and before that we covered we can define this in terms of our joint distribution and then in our marginal distribution if we do that we're going to get one Granted that this is our domain. You'll notice it's the same restriction that we get with our original uh, joint distribution. We also have zero otherwise. So this requires a little bit of thought and intuition into solving it. We want the conditional variance of y given that our random variable x equals little x. So we can see that the random variable, I'll write it over here. is uniform on the interval right here we could write that as x, x plus 1. Therefore, based on our knowledge of uniform distributions, its mean is going to be, clear away some space here, its mean is going to be x plus 1 half, and its variance is going to be 1 12. Now you could calculate all of this using calculus, but if you know properties of uniform distributions, which we previously covered in our last video lecture on um, random variables, it becomes immensely clear that this is indeed uniform and that 1 12th is our final answer. So um, if that doesn't make immediate sense, just go back Look at the video again. Try the problem out for yourself. There's an infinite number of resources for these kind of problems online. Otherwise, guys, this is my last video that I'll be doing with you guys. I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in, and I've had a blast doing these videos. So if anybody wants to um, take this up as their capstone project, I'm going to leave a video just showing how to um, upload videos and that kind of thing and how I recorded them. Otherwise, guys, thanks for tuning in, and have a nice day.